So to know somebody is to put them in a prison, and it's an act of enormous unkindness. True love is about creating space. And, you know, of course there's a level at which I know them. It would be foolish to say they wasn't. I know them very dearly, and I love them very dearly, and that's just because of the strange little idiosyncrasies, and there's, you know, there's a lot in there. But at the deepest level, I don't know them. Um, this not knowing also has a very practical edge. And the story I just told about my sisters is a good example. Um, so my, my daily meditation, I have, a, of course, a daily meditation practice. And so I get up and I'll, I'll sit. And um, a lot of the time, well, not a lot of the time, occasionally when I've got there's something thorny going on, um, it will come with me into my meditation. And it doesn't come with me here in my head. It comes with me in my heart. And my experience is And if I allow that situation to just stay there, you can say help comes, you can say wisdom comes, you can say it starts to solve itself, but by allowing it to be there and not knowing, not pushing, not trying to know, something wonderful and something beautiful can happen. Um, this is more, this not knowing is more than non-attachment or letting go. Um, there's an opening up to something beyond. Um, I'm going to bring us back to the realm of thought just for a little bit. So uh, there was a mathematician uh, sometime in the 20th century, Kurt Gödel, who, th there's a wonderful book, though it's, it's a complicated book, but I read it when I was in my 20s, Gödel Escherbach by Douglas R. Hofstadter, uh, which is a philosophical treatise, which is quite fascinating. But Gödel, who is that Kurt Gödel, he developed a theorem which in mathematical terms states in any axiomatic system, there are statements that can neither be proven to be true nor proven to be false. So in plain English, what that means is there are things, logical things, that you can't prove to be true or false because they aren't true or false. There's something else. So this is our logical system, our pure logical system of mathematics proving there are things we can't prove. Um, so the world, that's the way the world is. We, we think of it as being this binary, yes, no, true, false, sort of dichotomous world, but it really isn't. There's this profound realm in there of not knowing. Um, So I'm going to read something here. Actually, no, I'll, I'll say something else first and then I'll read. Um, another translation for this last sentence of this koan I read is, not knowing is best. And you can see why somebody would say best, but that's taking us back into this, to me, taking us back into the binary. Not intimate is, I feel much better with not intimate, but is most intimate rather. But what are we intimate with? What are we intimate with? So I'm going to jump to a little bit of a, another story. So this is the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra um, has a whole bunch of parables and stories in it. It's one of these logical treatises. And um, so here, chapter 11. At that time, there appeared before the Buddha a seven jeweled stupa. Are you familiar with stupas? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a seven jeweled stupa, 500 yojanas in height and 250 yojanas in breadth, welling up out of the earth and resting in midair, set about with sundry precious objects. It had 5,000 banisters, a thousand myriads of grotto like rooms, and numberless banners to adorn it. 
jeweled rosaries prey on from, and 10,000 millions of jeweled bells were suspended from the top. Tamala Patra Kandana scent issued from all four of its surfaces and filled the world. Its banners were made of the seven jewels, to wit gold, silver, viduria, giant clamshell, coral pearl, and carnelian. And its height extended to the palaces of the four god kings. The 33 gods rain down, so long, right? Um, and then it proceeds to um, all the uncountable numbers of ascended of assembled Buddhas and Bodhisattvas wanted to see what was in the actually no I missed a piece a voice rang out um, praising Buddha for preaching this sermon. So all these assembled Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, uncountable numbers of them wanted to see this guy. So Buddha gathers loads more people in and he floats up into the air and then he makes everybody else float up into the air and then the door opens and wow. Um, so something that may resonate more closely in this room is the 11th, I think it's the 11th chapter, chapter of the Gita, where Krishna reveals his universal nature. Yeah. There's this something that's just beyond. And in our stories, I love this kind of stuff, in our stories, we can get closer to it because we don't try and understand these stories. We can't understand these stories. If we try and understand these stories, we butcher them and we miss the message. This is in that, um, that mystical, that some. has lost this. It becomes this very um, un understanding emptiness, practice of compassion, which are really wonderful and worthy things. Um, and it is important we incorporate science, we incorporate the, the ways of the modern world in our practice. But I think it's really important we also um, remember these stories and remember the importance of which takes us, it transports us beyond ourselves to this place of not knowing. Um, and we encounter this not knowing routinely in our lives. I'll give you a couple of examples. So have any of you been in a room when a baby is born? Wow. <laughs> right? Well, it's just... You can't describe it. Has anybody been young and in love? <laughs> describe that. Um, seeing the sunrise over the Grand Canyon. These are mystical experiences. <laughs> and it happens in the strangest ways. I had uh, years ago now, one of my sisters was visiting me and we went to Disney World, which as you all know is advertised as a place for kids, but it's not, it's for grown-ups. The kids are an excuse for us to all go. <laughs> um, so we arrived in Disney World and the Magic Kingdom, she'd never been there before. We walked in through the front gate and there's um, the um, Sleeping Beauty's castle or whatever in front and there's, there weren't fireworks but there might as well have and you've got the streets and the Mickey Mouse and all the characters dancing around. And she was just frozen. I mean, she was just totally overcome by awe. Just stepping in there. And it reminded me of when uh, I'd been in the Grand Canyon with my mother uh, a few years previously. And when the sun came up, my mum was just frozen, just in total awe. So this can come to us. Um, and it's always unpredictable because if you anticipate it, by definition, it's not going to happen. But there are so many opportunities, so many places where this can show up. And when it does, you say, oh, that was, that was an amazing experience. Okay, where are we going now? <laughs> we try and bring ourselves back to this ordinary world, which is the wrong way around. <laughs> Completely the wrong way around. Because that world, that world of mystery, that world of not knowing, that world of awe, is the real world. Yes, we have to function in this world. 
It's important, so there is a practical side. But that place of not knowing is the place of profundity, of beauty, of happiness, of, if you will, meaning. So these kind of stories, these stories, the experiences of the uh, the Grand Canyon and the, the delivery room, these are experiences that can kind of jolt us into that place of not knowing. But we can also intentionally cultivate this place of not knowing in our lives. The story I gave of um, my recent experiences with my sisters, where we can we can find those places and we can intentionally step back from it. So okay, maybe this is where I need to go now. And when we do that, when we drop into this place of not knowing. Um, we become intimate with everything. Is that word intimacy? We're intimate with everything. When we're intimate with the Grand Canyon, it's with the whole of creation. Mm. And when we're intimate with everything, in a very profound sense, profound sense, we are becoming intimate with ourselves, with who we really are. what I have for you. So questions, comments, anyone? Sri Ramakrishna said there is his and there is not and something beyond is and is not. And I think that's exactly what you were talking about. It is. And uh, science uh, late early 20th century science starts to take us there with uh, quantum theory. Quantum, mm -hmm. well, not quantum theory, but with uh, the recognition of the quantum nature of reality. Um, the quantum nature of reality actually kind of misstates it a little bit because it's, you know, things exist only in certain states. But it's the before they exist in the certain states, there's the mystery, it's this cloud. That there's a place of profound not knowing. Mm -hmm. that is the real fabric of reality. But by um, staying in a place of, of pure objectivity without room for subjectivity, because mm -hmm. those two aren't different. When I know the universe, I know myself. But the su subject and object collapse. Mm -hmm. um, our science can't take us there, which is part of, at least the way it's currently constructed, which is one of the the reasons why we're all sitting in here right now. I think you said this not knowing is something of the heart. Yeah. And that's certainly does comport with the experience that this place tries to describe. Somebody, a wise person, probably said many times independently, and I have no idea who, where I got it from. The longest journey is the journey from the head to the heart. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's um, the way that we are in this culture experiencing the world. We're so centered on the head so much of the time that that is just, it's a really long journey these days. Yeah. Is not knowing similar to surrender? Um, Yes, um, I think there's another piece beyond surrender. So it is surrender. You have to surrender to get to not knowing. Um, so you surrender into what is. You surrender into letting things happen, perhaps. But it's not just being okay with what happened. It's letting go of us. It's not putting mental constructs around any of the things that happen. It's um, so surrendering. Um, think of the world as events rather than as things. Uh, we tend to think of nouns and verbs, but 
think of events as like little big nows, or big moments of now, if you will. Um, so we surrender into just allowing events to be, but we've also got to let go of the labels around those events. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're categorizing stuff into what we have categorized yes. our categories. Get rid of our labels. Get rid of our stories. We're a package of stories. Mm -hmm. We go around imposing our stories. So it's not just letting go of what's going on. It's getting our story back, basically. That's actually one of the reasons why I've been working with this book now for about a year, and I keep on going into it. There's more every time I come back to it. Uh, and uh, I'm realizing, and I'm sure there's just decades more if I have that many years to come, um, of unfolding this, the extent to which it's full of parables, right? I mean, that's one of the things that's wonderful about it. It's one you may have heard is the parable of the burning house, where the house catches fire, the father's three, all the father's myriad children are running around in the house flaming. He says, come on out, come on out, the house is burning. And they won't come out. So what are we going to do? He says, okay, I've got three carts. I've got a goat cart and I've got, a, I've got lots of carts, but there are three kinds, goat carts, deer carts, ox carts. Kids, come on out. You love these carts. So they all come running out. Mm -hmm. And he gives them the great white bullock cart. Now, is that the same as the ox cart? Because there's, there's the, the Buddhist story is there's three vehicles. And is this the same? Is the ox the same as the bullock? He doesn't tell you. <laughs> and so some people have historically collapsed those two. And so you've got this one dharma, this one teaching that's universalizing all the teachings, the story. And you've got this one teaching that encompasses everything. So here it is. I've got it. It's right here. <laughs> um, and so, it can, you know, this we are so prone to take all these really wide open stories and put them in a box. It doesn't resolve it. You've got to not resolve stuff. You already mentioned the name of that. What's the name of this book? That book yeah. It's the Lotus Sutra. Oh, okay, that's the name of the book. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Okay, it is the Lotus. Sutra. It is the Lotus Sutra. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How does this not only, like, we all know that this, uh, we don't know everything out there, so that is that. So, how does that become relevant to uh, going with the mindset of not knowing and then uh, what is it going to help us with? Like, I can go around to, I can, I can, like, as it was the same story, like, I can go out uh, without knowing like, where I'm going to go. I can just go around with that. But how is that going to help you out or, or are we going to achieve all of that? Um, <clears throat> so uh, the world we live in, the world we've created as, uh, for ourselves, um, I watch my kids go through school uh, and the expectation is, okay, you've got to graduate. Because if you gra only if you get graduate with a good GPA can you get to a good university. And then you go to this good university and you work hard because you've got to graduate with a good GPA so you can get a good job. And then you get the good job and you've got to work hard and you've got to perform and you get to get good evaluations so you can get a pay increase and a promotion and the next good job. And you keep going for like 60 years, 80 years, however long it is. And then you lie back on your bed as you start fading away and say, I've had a good life. Because I've accomplished all these things. None of that stuff makes you happy. Um, the not knowing, allowing not knowing to arise, allows us to stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon in a place of openness. 
place of vulnerability. And so when the sun comes up, it can knock us over. Mm -hmm. Just completely knock us over. Thomas Merton, who was a um, Cistercian monk, uh, there's, a, what, there's many lovely stories about him, but one of the stories about Thomas Merton, he was in the monastery in Gethsemane, and every once in a blue moon, they'd let them out of the monastery. So he went shopping. He, it's his turn to go into town and go shopping. And he walked up down the street, and just out of the blue, he was overcome and he fell to his knees. Mm. He said, he's God and he's God and she's God and he's God. If they only knew. Mm. That incredible experience, that um, intimacy with life, intimacy with the universe, but intimacy with life above all is only possible if we move to that place where we're, we're not known, we're cultivating this space of not known. Um, now, if you want to be practical about it, which one can be, uh, there are business schools, or maybe not business schools, but there are business coaches that train people in cultivating creativity and they train people in mindfulness and cultivating openness because it will enhance creativity, enhance your business productivity and therefore enhance your career prospects. So this is one of those things that has been latched onto by the business world in a rather mercenary kind of way. So it's a rather limited kind of way, but it's useful in that sense. The far deeper point though is the Thomas Merton story. Does that help? Yeah. This, is, this, is a, this is a rough um, paraphrase, but one of Rumi's poems says, I hope I don't end up on my deathbed feeling I have not kissed enough. Mm. Mm. Concept of not knowing is so easy expressed with admissions. Each mission is trying to say it is indescribable. Words cannot match what you feel is the right. condition. And then they are trying to go about it, not pinpointing what it's like. And then say, is it smaller than this small legs? Yeah. Very bigger, and you know the whole method of it. That's very interesting. And the second thing, when you describe that feeling of <coughs> awe and the presence of something that deeply touches you or even overwhelms you mm -hmm. or bewilders you, just like Arjun. Yes. When you saw the chapter 9 of Gita, when you saw Krishna's different, different, huge, monstrous mm. heads and teeth and all, he says, stop it. I cannot take it anymore. Yeah. So it could be frightening, it could be bewildering, it can be all inspiring, all together. All of that, yeah. all together. And <laughs> On the light side, not knowing will not help if you're taking a flight and don't know the time That's that you're to reach. <laughs> then not knowing will not work. Yeah. You've got to be practical. practical. I mean, there is yes. a sac sack of skin and bones that's moving around in the world. <laughs> you have responsibilities to other people and planes to catch. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Very but very the very truth is, if you miss your plane, mm. odds are it really doesn't matter. <laughs> not not in the grand scheme of things. It's not, the beach. Yeah. it's not an excuse for going around and not catching your plane. But the yeah. truth is, if you don't catch it, yeah. no big deal. What you going to do? I think that concept of shunata. Mm -hmm. That 
It flies here. It does. Open nets. Yeah. It's not empty. Yes, it exactly. It's really ready to experience. <clears throat> yeah, the, uh, I steered away from talking about Shunyata, um, but you brought it up, so I will talk about it a little bit. Um, Xi Yi, who was a Chinese philosopher, talked about um, Shunyata as follows, uh, because there's a there's a tendency, and it's a tendency Buddhism has, a lot of spiritual traditions have it, of perceiving reality as Shunyata. So we leave this world behind, and we go to this place. And can be taken as kind of an escapism, this kind of this reification of shunyata. Um, but she talked about this as there's the two there's two worlds. There's the, the world of tables and fists and that, that hurts when you hit it too hard, and there's the world of shunyata, which is this emptiness or um, openness. I, I love the word openness. Openness is a better word. It's also used. Um, Boundlessness is a little bit sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but he talks about um, coming from the, um, the constructed or the relative towards shunyata. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about coming from shunyata to the constructed. So you've got to be, you don't stay in these places. One way of experiencing reality is to move from shunyata to the constructed or relative world. Another way is to move from the relative or constructive world to shunyata. But the third way is to hold both of them. Because mm -hmm. that is, that's what this really is. Um, and to pick up on what you're saying, um, or in the presence of something that transcends us, something that is indescribable. So I just couldn't comprehend this. This cup of coffee was the most precious. What what is it? I think it's a cup of coffee, but that's that's a story. It's just another story. It's the whole universe, and it really is the whole universe. Uh, I used to like uh, sometimes when I used to swim and then from outside and like look at tree. Yeah, the better of all. Uh, and, and and sometimes uh, like uh, if there's certain a certain amount of mute, uh, there's a music there's a rhythm and follow the same rule, then you follow that you follow that follow that and like you don't really expect it you just keep following that and you get a sense of all and that as well. You said you used to. Does that not happen anymore? Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's wonderful. With with music at least. Yeah, but the swimming pool thing coming out and seeing the tree. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and it can happen in a forest as well, like if you're stretching yep. in a forest and like listening to music, that music sort of... Um... The reason I asked whether you said it, you, you used to have that, you, uh, the reason I asked it that way is this is truly something kids experience much more than adults. Mm -hmm. Kids see fairies. Mm -hmm. Adults generally don't. Yeah. A very dear friend of mine does see fairies. Mm -hmm. Because she's not forgotten how to. She's not forgotten how to or trained herself not to. Mm -hmm. Got that the wrong way around. You forget the training. She's trained us. Most of us train ourselves not to see fairies anymore. Train we ourselves. Get we get trained. That's right. Thank you. Who wouldn't want to? So, um, yeah, so it's there. It's there all the time. It's every moment. It's there. It's available. William Blake. Continue mm. to see fairies, and uh, 
one time someone came to see Mr. Blake and presented his card. Mrs. Blake said, oh, I'm sure Mr. Blake would love to see you, but it seems that Mr. Blake is not with us today. <laughs> and it was William Blake who wrote on the end, the world in a grain of sand. Coming to the point of Shinyata, um, I heard a few lines on that that um, everything that we do, like um, we go to market, we buy pot, we go to market, buy a suitcase, freeze, and everything else. What exactly we are buying is uh, a amount of emptiness. That's exactly <laughs> so that we can fill that in and um, so explaining it that we can realize that you know how everything is been held under that emptiness. So what is that? Yeah. Reminds me of a story of a, a Zen teacher who had somebody come visit him. And this person visited notionally because this person was looking for a teacher and for advice and wisdom. So the Zen master gets out the tea set and the little wooden thing, he put it all on and laid out the ceremony. And this person who's visiting starts just talking, and bringing, you know, well, they just start talking. So the Zen master comes to tea and he starts pouring. The person carries on talking. Yeah. And eventually the person says, stop, 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 the cup's full. He says, yes, it's very hard to put something into something that's already full, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is the way we are in the world. We carry all these it's stories. We carry our stories around that we don't. The problem is, if we realize they were stories, it will be fine. Because we'd hold them lightly. And we'd recognize there's nothing solid there. And they can shift, their meaning can shift, the story can shift. But we don't, we hold on to them as some kind of reality. So I had to do all these stories. I went, went to China uh, for, a, for a trip and I saw like in Shenzhen there was like, uh, there, there are tea shops and, and the tea is very subtle. Mm -hmm. It's almost like water, mild flavor. Yep. And then it, it's almost like cultural sort of meditational, you know, you're not supposed to do anything. <laughs> I don't know if it's coming from those Buddhist uh, approaches. Well, it's which comes first, the culture or the, or the faith? I mean, it's so deeply enmeshed. Yeah. But yeah, it's a very, um, it, but this, I've, I've been there and I've been through tea ceremonies there as well, and it's very lovely, very lovely. I took note on that emptiness. Um, I got a gift packet, you know, the potato gift place packet from my kids, my daughter, and then she's happy with that packet. But as soon as you open it, you know, the air flows out and that sinks. Yes. Then she started complaining, you know, uh, it's only something much is there. It's like I need more packets. Okay. So the importance of that emptiness, you know, to convince the kids yeah. is it's not easy. I was trying to tell that, okay, see, because of this space is there, that's why you're getting some fish out of it. Okay? Yeah. So, but for elementary kids, it is really difficult. Yeah. Tom. So I can really relate to the story of the Zen master pouring the tea and the cup overflowing because that's me. Uh, there's so many things. I'm retired, I don't have to work. Uh, there's so many things that I'm interested in and curious about that it's impossible to follow up on all of them. And I know just in the course of sitting here with you, you mentioned one dharma, and I thought, yeah, I need to learn more about one dharma. I've heard about that. I should, I should read more about one dharma. <laughs> and, then, and then you mentioned that the Lotus Sutra book that you'd be working with that for the next 10 years. And I thought, yeah, that's cool. I should, I should get, dig it. But then there's a bunch of projects at home or a bunch of books at home that I won't have time to read. You know, I'm fascinated by uh, so many things. Can't possibly do them all. Uh, so anyway, that's my, just my situation. But then that's fine too. That's just my situation. And that's 
that's modern life. And I'm really lucky to be able to access so much. But uh, anyway, that's my story. Thank you. What you find there is it's really important because what we're talking about here is so countercultural. Because kids do get told at high school that you've got to graduate with a good GPA. And they do get told when they get that GPA and get to a good university all the way on down the line, right? Um, and so much of our culture is oriented around this progression that has to do with learning, with book learning, with studying. Um, so letting go of some of that learning is so countercultural. Mm -hmm. The learning doesn't make you happy. You know, at one level it can. I mean, it can be really useful. I don't mean to diminish it completely, but it can be really, really useful. And it, I mean, my dad's a retired surgeon, but he hadn't spent years in medical school and years of work practicing surgeon and became a consultant. He would have been unable to say what the problem was. Right? So it is really useful. It is really useful. I don't mean to, you know, to diminish it. But, uh, It creates a lot of happiness and joy about wondering about things and then giving an answer. Just like there's there's a lot of happiness and joy from listening to music and being affected by it, or a lot of happiness and joy standing in the Grand Canyon. You know, I wasn't there when the sun rose up, rose, but I remember looking out at the Grand Canyon and just there was something about the size of it that just sort of like altered my altered me in some way it, it discombobulated me in a joyous way and uh, so yeah curiosity and learning is one more thing uh exercise and swimming is one more thing being with children is one more thing all of them are joyous can't possibly do all of them uh, so yeah i'm the guy i'm the i'm the guy that just keeps bored with you and stuff uh, here I am, and here I am to tell you about it. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> uh, I, I can think of like two approaches, you know, and there's one approach where, let's say if I'm studying Buddhism or like, let's say I'm hearing two lectures of, you know, Pakistani Buddhism, and I am in the mindset, yeah, I need to finish all of this. So the lesson takes me, I know, I need to learn this, I need to finish this, and, <laughs> But you don't get the joy out of it, and possibly when you hear it, you just hear, hear the literal stuff. First of all, yeah. But then th there are times when I just I just have to immerse myself in the joy of what I'm hearing and forget about maybe they want it like ten two, two times, three times. I don't get lost. I don't care whether I'm gonna finish it or not. At that time, there's a different sort of learning from me and a lot of joy and all. So it's sometimes hard to oscillate between these two because. On one hand, you do want to complete all of that, and you want to get the totality of it. And on the other hand, you don't even care. Like you just momentarily, you know, take whatever is there in the moment. How do you balance this? Or maybe you don't need to balance it. Yeah. So um, if you if you work really intentionally to balance it, you kind of created a trap for yourself, haven't you? Mm -hmm. I find. You look at the library of the, what the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, staggering. Swami Vivekananda, staggering. And what they actually accomplished in the world, the, the legacy, staggering. So again, this is, um, it's a way of holding our learning differently. It's not getting caught up in the learning for its own sake. It's a way of holding it differently.
but it's an experiential thing. It's not one that can really be described. That's exactly it. It's an experiential thing. And you just never know what it's going to pop into your life. But my late wife, Marjorie, we were staying with some friends at a place called Boulder Creek, California, which is not far from the village, huge redwoods. So we were invited, oh, would you like to go see the great redwoods? So we were walking among these great white redwoods. And Marjorie had an experience that you know, not knowing is beyond description. She just, something about those trees, their presence, something, no, not, she wasn't able to describe it, but it was just overwhelming and it was life transforming. And you used the word awe for me. So that was the, that was the feeling that she was left with. And it, you know, we can have all the descriptors here, they're over 2,000 years old, there's so many feet high that that is something to go out. But that isn't it. It is something about the presence yeah. in that moment. And she simply was overwhelmed. And it was a life transforming experience. It's there on the Grand Canyon. It's there in the California Redwoods. Mm -hmm. It's there on a cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's there every moment of our lives. Mm -hmm. And we create this boundary. Mm -hmm. We create this barrier that keeps us from it. May I offer something from Zoom? Well, you know, you've talked about the ability to hold the two thoughts at once. Mm -hmm. Around here, that's described as one of the defining characteristics of the true spiritualist. They can hold the world of the practical right. left mind and the other <laughs> openness mm -hmm. at the same time. One of the, the great spiritual um, I guess I'd say trick or practice or skill. It's just simply mindfulness. Mm -hmm. As you all know better than I, the mm -hmm. Buddha, the root book is to wake up or to, it's knowledge waking up. Um, and in simple terms, we spend most of our lives not present <laughs> with what's going on. We're caught up in our stories, we're caught up in what we're doing, we're caught up in what somebody's saying. We're just not present. We are not awake. We wake up in the morning from this not being present to what was going on for six or eight hours to being present. You're present for a few minutes and then you get caught up in what's going on on the radio or what, you know, whatever. <laughs> what Brother Shankar, you're talking about is only possible if we are present. Mm -hmm. Practice mindfulness, practice cultivate awareness. That's it. Everything is possible if we are present. And, and the, the, the great open secret is that presentness, that presence is always there in us. Yeah, it is the trust. That's what, that's what recognizing a cup of coffee. There's a lovely little book by Mother Teresa also was here today. She did. She the need to pray more times during the day. I think some people might have some questions on the Zoom if Please. they want this. Does anybody have any questions they would like to ask Eric? Yeah. So 
that's I thought I heard someone speaking. But okay, putting them in the chat, maybe. Um, nope. Okay. At some point, we have to draw a distinction between information, knowledge, and wisdom. Yeah. Basically, the colleges that you describe, that then you will be this, and then you will be, then you will have PhD, and then you will be the dean, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. They don't have an end point. And in the in the first place, you are not allowed to ask the question that by going to the college, I want to be happy. If they say, I'm going to college so that I'm happy, then a wise man will say, you are knocking on the wrong doors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Right. Because this is not the place to make you happy. But if you're talking about survival, yes. Because survival also is very important. We cannot just deny that. We cannot be so absurd about the fascinating idea of not knowing that we do not know enough how to survive. But then survival is not the end point. It's a means. And that means is absolutely necessary. And that's the reason why I think we have to give a different kind of education. Yeah. That this education will take you up to this particular point. And beyond that, you are of your own. If you want to go, you want to learn that takes exactly like with the story that the man, when he wanted to cross the river, he gave a little float. And he says, this float will take you from this bank of the river to that bank of the river. But if you want to go to the mountain, you are of your own. Yeah. <clears throat> so, um, you made me think of a couple of things. Thing one, um, this uh, I've come across this in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It's probably used elsewhere. Uh, that there are three levels of I'll use knowledge because that's what you were the word you were using. Uh, there is study and listening. There is reflection, hmm. and then there is meditation. Yeah. Those are the three levels. Um, the reflection is the most profound we can engage in, in the relative world, the world of stuff. And that is the world of the philosopher. But the philosopher will never find truth because the philosopher does not understand meditation, which takes us to the non-dual. This is about non-dual. Uh, the second, you talked about survival. Um, yeah, we've got to be practical. We've got to remember we've got a plane to catch, right? Uh, but we also have to not be greedy about what that survival means. I have no idea about it. It does it itself. Mm -hmm. Why do I spend so much time worrying about the other 10%? The body knows how to do that too. Why don't I just let it do that? Yeah. Yeah. Our body is a really, really smart thing if you just let it do its own stuff. The story at the beginning was um, this monk taking off into the wilderness um, with inner robe, outer robe, um, Cape or anyway, three garments, a bowl, a toothpick, a staff, and a couple of other things. That's actually enough. That and then he's used to living out there. He knows what's edible, what's not edible. That is knowledge. That's learning. Um, but it's not a learning that he's really holding on to. It's just it's in his bones. It's a deeply embedded knowledge. So we've got. Um, a tendency to overconstruct that practical and survival piece mm -hmm. at the expense of yeah. the non-dual piece. Exactly. Exactly. See, I, I, I agree with you. The body is enormously wise. Yeah. It's not ordinary wisdom. It's a very innate, deep, real knowledge wisdom. Yeah. But at the same time, 
we are overdoing that. We are interfering with the we process are. of the body, and that's how we survive. Yeah. Because if we don't, if we don't do that one, how shall we? Shall the doctor survive? So, <laughs> so I had I had a beautiful uh, cartoon in which the the doctor comes to the home and he says, "I'm so glad you called me in time. Had you waited for two days, this would have cured itself." <laughs> It's a lovely story. It was an unusually honest doctor. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody over here has something. Yeah. Yes. How does this not knowing relate to what Buddha teaches on the Nirvana part of not this? How does uh, like like Buddha was like Buddha is awakened state, right? Like he didn't like Buddha. It's not like he spent like intense meditation with them to know something. So, so how does this not knowing and then uh, the teaching of Buddha? It's like Buddha has to pass on like multiple lives to attain this Buddha hood and mm -hmm. reach that point. And this not knowing, like, how does uh, like what is this teaching? So, um, the knowing that happens when one wakes up is not rational knowing. It's not knowing you can learn from a book. Um, the multiple lives, um, so, so I, there are lots of different ways of understanding karma. The way that I understand karma, and it's a, a Buddhist frame of reference mm -hmm. rather than the Sanatana Dharma frame of reference, but the way I understand it relative to karma is um, rather than than thinking that we create our karma and then are reborn to manifest that karma. Karma is, is the thing. And these are all in Buddhist terms, expedient means, skillful means, teaching methods. None of these have any reality of their own, but they're useful tools. So karma is that frame of um, causality. It's the frame of morality, of behavior, out of which beings crystallize, things crystallize. So it's like a sea of karma, and you've got these things crystallizing out. So the continuation of being three births are just a continuation of this certain elements of this sea of karma just showing up over time. And um, <clears throat> the multiple births, this is analogous to uh, the Sanatana Dharma view of it, the multiple births are, if you will, the cleansing of karma over time. And it is only it is only when all of those veils, so it's that karma is a veil that obstructs our ability to see clearly. It is only when we've removed all of those veils that we can see clearly. But seeing clearly is like standing on the rim of the Grand Canyon when the sun comes up. Every instant, every instant, seeing just what this really is every instant feeling nothing but the most profound of compassion and love for everything so it wasn't something learned if you will it was everything else was unlearned in order to create space for waking up to happen does that make sense mm -hmm. well, that, that started a little late so we've run over the hour, which is fine. Yeah, anyway, so I, if you'd like to carry on, we'll carry on. Well, I'll say something. Oh, where this gets really confusing for me is with uh, children. Mm -hmm. And the, the example recently, I was, I'm involved with a refugee family uh, that has children, and the mother speaks English well enough that we can communicate because I know how to do it to talk slow and use simple sentences and so on. But she couldn't really communicate with the teachers. 
Uh, so I became the interme intermediary. The, the son is in fifth grade and he's having trouble in school. He's not doing well. So uh, parents are real concerned about it. So I talked to the teachers and, and I learned that kid's not doing his homework. He'd much rather play than do his home homework. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was involved in kind of coming down hard on the kid. Uh, like you got to do your homework. You know, mm -hmm. you can't go out. It, but now I'm wondering. So he's, he's in the fifth grade. It means he can read. He can do basic math. He has the, the basic skills to say he, maybe he's going to become a ballet dancer, you know, or a gardener or something that, that requires no advanced education. Are we just stifling his, his playful spirit by making him do his homework? Or... Are we helping him prepare to survive in our society by making him do his homework? And, and I don't know. I don't have an answer. Oh. But another, another thing that hit me was another group of people and kids, we went to the beach. And I realized that the, the kids were just totally enthusiastic and totally joyful <laughs> in a way that doesn't happen for us very often, mm -hmm. but happens to them just with a simple trip, trip to the beach. But they just want to be grown-ups. You know, they think life will be, but they don't realize that they may be in the happiest, most joyfully before time in their life. So, but, but my, my real question is about making kids do their homework. Why they'd rather play. I'll answer the question with kind of a question. Okay. So, um, Beethoven, Actually, before I even get to Beethoven, Bach, John Sebastian Bach, not recognized in his time. He was a Kapellmeister, which, you know, his, a lot of his music, some of his music was just lost. And some of his music was found, um, I mean, seriously, rack and cheese. They got his original manuscript. Beethoven at the foot of his bed yeah. had a copy of Brown, oh, excuse me, of Bach's Well Tempered Clavier. He used to just pick it up and read it. Um, and it's really tough to write the next great American novel if you haven't read all the great novels. <laughs> um, Martin Luther wrote his 93 treatises yeah. or however many it was, said, you know, screw all this monastic stuff. He could only do that because he was a former monastic. He'd done the work. There is great joy to be had in mastering something, and it is necessary to master in order to transcend. Um, and then there's another story, which is one where a Brother Shankar told me this many years ago now, and I will butcher Brother Shankar, so correct me if necessary. But the gist of it was he's hanging out with a bunch of his um, fellow monastics, or fellow uh, uh, Vedanta teachers. And uh, somebody's late, and he cracks a wise one about in the uh, in the Sanatana the Dharma. There's no late, no early. And somebody turns around and says, "Wrong!" <laughs> Before realization, there is late and early. After realization, there is not. Um, so um, the point we're making is to be held gently. To be held gently. There isn't an answer. Mm -hmm. And the Finns send their children to school six hours a day, five days a week, and they have no homework. And they are some of the most accomplished students by all standardized testing in the entire world. This is in uh, Michael Moore's film, Virtual Holy Days Man. And we send our kids to school for ridiculous periods of time and give them enormous amounts of homework. 
and we're not on the world stage with our school education level. So, as I said, it's to be held gently, Tom. There isn't an answer. There isn't an answer. The children should be encouraged in their heartfelt activities for you and not discouraged, which they so often. Yeah, one other thing I meant to bring up in answer to, in, in to on this point, I talk about one dharma. You say I can read one dharma. The whole <laughs> point of one dharma. So that parable of the, the are there three cups or are there four? Are there three workers or are there four? Because if there's three, it means there's really only one, which means you throw the rest of the way and we just bully everybody into that one. If there's four, it's like, well, it's what I see on the wall around here. You've got Judaism, you've got um, Taoism, Buddhism, mm -hmm. you know, it's incredibly open, incredibly open. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I have a, uh, an explanation. Um, and so often I've discovered that let's say there's an activity which I have to do and I don't like it and you know, I'm not interested, something like a homework or whatever. Let's say I'm studying physics. But I have to hold myself, concentrate on it forcibly. And once I complete like maybe three hours, four hours, six hours or whatever, then I get into the joy when I really like love doing it. But that, that's that's a sort of a pain and a tapasya that I, I need to go to reach that point. So if I were a child and I was never trained to do that tapasya, then as an adult I would actually feel sorry for myself and feel bad that my teachers and parents did not train me for that or did not introduce me to that. Yes. Yes. I, I'm uh, not saying like it's not so uh, I mean, I had teachers as I mentioned, like from his from that. I worked with a lot of kids that came from. Um, I also worked with inner city school children. They came from different countries, different cultures, and they don't have school to play. They don't like they want to play. They do not want to work. So we have to know that what is the real cause? Why yeah. they want to play? So there's a different way. Maybe with language barrier, or maybe they need to learn something. any education. It had been pretty stable, even if you go back 50, 70 years, education had been pretty stable for a relatively long period of time. So when kids were being raised, there was a structure and then yes. there were habitual patterns, generation, intergenerational habitual patterns. We're living in a very strange time where we move from modernism to postmodernism and now arguably we're moving beyond postmodernism into I don't know what is. Um, and as part of that, we've gone through this substantial trend where humanism has become in a way a religion of today mm -hmm. and a profound way that humanism is embraced in this society this society not just being america but just like the 21st century emerging global society is the um sacredness of every individual perspective every individual experience of reality and there's real value and wonder in doing that. But there's also real difficulty. And it makes things like the challenge you're bringing out, Tom, particularly challenging. Because in that place where each individual is independently valued, where everybody in the school gets a trophy for their educational accomplishments, and they're all valued equally, who are we to judge kind of thing? The kids are being trained. <laughs> it, what, how do you answer that question in that construct? Right? And I'm not expressing an opinion about the right or the wrong of that construct, mm -hmm. simply observing in that framework, it does become very hard. But there are wonderful things about that framework, actually very challenging. This incidentally, now getting a little philosophical, uh, deals with the shift that I see from one dharma as this open thing, where we truly can 
valuing everybody, but it's not, there's no truth. There are higher truths, there's more truth. Mm -hmm. We create space for everybody, but there are ways of building meta structures, meta frameworks, as opposed to every truth is sacred. And so we've got this militant, my one dharma, your one dharma. Mm -hmm. Very different way of doing it. Let there be peace in outer space. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the water. Let there be peace in the sky, on the earth, and in the water. Let there be peace in the herbs, and the plants, and the trees. Let there be peace in the earth, and the plants, and the trees. May the gods be peaceful. May the gods be peaceful. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. May the whole universe be pervaded by peace. Let that infinite universal peace prevail throughout my universe. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace. Peace be unto us and to all beings everywhere. Jai Shri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai, Durga Durga Durga. May we be safe. May we be healthy. May we be cheerful. May we have peace of mind. May we go forward in the loving and protective embrace of the divine being as our mother and father. So until we gather again, let me just say with the most heartfelt gratitude, Jared, thank you for being with us this morning and for offering your very considerable wisdom gathered, as I know just from my own personal experience at least, from both inner and outer search and the willingness to let go of that which does not go. Thank you all for having me here and for your participation in our lovely conversation. Thank you. Good to see you. And the next time we do this, we will have our technology flat beforehand. <laughs> So that we won't be struggling the way we did this morning. That was, at the very least, inconsiderate of a lot of people, including yourself. So, uh, for those of you who wish to, let's adjourn inside and we'll have uh, something to eat. I think yeah, I saw that uh, Niranjana and Sundar brought some food to, to offer for us. And there's this and that for the other that we can pull together this. One of the greatest things we can thank his father for is his son. <laughs> so um, I had to speak to Brother Shankar while I was visiting my dad recently. And Shankar, I conveyed that to him. Good, good. Because he actually expressly asked me to think twice. And what did your father say? He mumbled and reasoned. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he said switch, right? Yeah, he had a year ago. <laughs> <laughs>